Minister and I released Canada's new defence policy, Our North Strong and Free, which was a renewed vision for Canada's defence. We developed this policy. Um, actually, I'm going to, if, if I may, this, they, they put the wrong document in front of me here. I'm back. Uh, when we could. Uh, yeah, well, I could just wing it. I'm, I'm here to talk to you about the mains and estimates. For some reason, my people are, are rather scrambling right now to, to pull that up. But I have that information in front of me. Thanks very much. Uh, Pleased to join you today to provide a, a overview of the main estimates for the Department of National Defense, the Canadian Armed Forces, and the Communication Security Establishment. These estimates come at a rather critical time. Countries like Russia and China are challenging the rules-based international order. Technological advances are enhancing the state's abilities to project military might. And, of course, climate change is making Canada's north far more accessible. Each of these challenges has significant implications for the defence and security of our country and our allies and partners around the world. We are going to meet these challenges while remaining responsible stewards of public funds. And as such, we're requesting almost $30.6 billion through this year's Maine's estimates. This represents a 15.46% increase over last year's Maine's estimates, and it's planned increases in operating funding, incremental funding for international operations, capital funding, and in-service support funding, just to highlight a few of the planned expenditures. We are also requesting just over a billion dollars to the communications uh, security establishment to further their foreign intelligence, cybersecurity, and cyber mandate. These investments support the goals of Canada's new defence policy, are North Strong and Free, in defending Canada's values and global interests. I would like to provide you with an overview of some of the key items that we'll be presenting here today. Members of the Canadian Armed Forces uh, support peace, freedom and democracy around the world. To further these efforts, we are requesting $797 million um, in, towards the following operations, Operation Reassurance, which supports NATO's assurance and deterrence measures in Central and Eastern Europe, Unifier, which provides military training to the armed forces of Ukraine, Impact, which has, is helping to build the military capabilities of Iran, Jordan and Lebanon, and Artemis, which provides maritime security in the Western Indian, o the Western Indian Ocean. This funding also supports the continued implementation of the Indo-Pacific strategy, and beyond these lines of efforts, we are also requesting $893.5 million in grants and contributions. And this money will go towards initiatives like the Military Training and Cooperation Program, which provides Ukraine with additional military aid and further supports Operation Unifier and Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy through Operation Horizon. It will also go towards NATO programs that help us defend Canada's interests and values while contributing to international peace and security. To carry out these critical operations and defend our interests, military members must be well equipped. And we are therefore requesting $7.2 billion to ensure that they have the right capabilities to do their jobs, including up to 16 next-generation multi-mission aircraft through the Canadian Multi-Mission Aircraft Project, up to nine CC-330 multi-rolled tanker support aircraft through the Strategic Tanker Transport Capability Project, an initial set of the 16 F-35 advanced fighter aircraft and associated equipment services through the future fighter uh, capability project, and as well 15 ships as part of the Canadian Surface Combatant Project, among other items. Part of this funding will also go towards enhancing and strengthening the Canadian Armed Forces digital capabilities and maintain software, boost cybersecurity, improve data management, and foster innovation. Another $613 million will allow us to advance major capitalist acquisition projects like the Point Defense Missile System upgrade and the lightweight torpedo upgrade. It will allow us to acquire short-range and long-term missiles and replenish CAF ammunition and explosives that were donated to Ukraine. And, Mr. Chair, none of this work in, it could be possible without our military and civilian members. They are, of course, our greatest asset. We are requesting approximately $1.1 billion towards fair compensation for CAF members as reflected in the updated military pay and collective agreement. And additionally, $446 million towards the long-term disability payments and life insurance plans 
for CAF members and approximately $1.8 billion in contributions toward the employment benefit plans for military and civilian staff. Mr. Chair and committee members, as part of the Refocusing Government Spending Initiative announced in Budget 2023, we have included $613 million in approved reductions in these main estimates. These reductions are intended to minimize the impact on military readiness so that we stay effective in the rapidly evolving defense and security domain. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister Blair. Mr. Brazan, six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Minister. Thanks for joining us today. Um, of course, this past uh, week or so, we've been hearing criticisms from our allies on uh, Canada failing to meet uh, the NATO target. Uh, we heard from the Americans. Uh, Donald Tusk, uh, Prime Minister of Poland, uh, has raised this concern uh, lately, as well as Prime Minister of Estonia. Um, Minister, do you believe Canada should be at the 2%? Yes, I do, and I, and I can also share with you that we're working very hard to achieve that, and in fact... But they, you, you have in the main estimates that are here, the budget that you've tabled, the DPU that, that was just released, no plans on getting to 2%. Prime Minister Trudeau is quoted uh, in uh, secret documents that were released to the media uh, some time ago that Canada will never make the 2%. So who's stopping you as Minister of Defence from getting to 2%? Well, if I may answer your question. Um, first of all, the, the, the budgetary increases I present here in the new mains estimate, pl plus the money that will be included in, in the budget when passed that we've just introduced um, in Parliament, it will result in, a, in a, an increase in our defence spending by 27% next year over this year, and it brings us much closer to that 2%. The things that we have articulated in these estimates, under the Strong, Secure and Engaged project, and now in the new Defence Policy Update, are now strong and free, brings us to 1.76, but we've also indicated, uh, Mr. Bazan, to our allies and to Canadians, that in addition to those things which are now fully funded once that budget is passed, and I very much look forward to your support in, in getting that budget through. Well, Minister, you know that, that, that uh, there's a lot in that budget that we disagree with that we aren't going to be funding, and we know that uh, most of the funding that you had in your DPU is backloaded for the future government. It's not going to be for this first government. You said yourself the Canadian Armed Forces are in a death spiral. You say that we need 6,700 military housing units, and yet in this budget, in these estimates, and in the next year's uh, budget that was in the DPU, there's zero funding for new military housing. We're in a retention and recruitment problem, and yet one of the problems we're hearing is that our troops are living rough, they are unhoused, they're living in tents, cars and campers, uh, or living in precarious situations uh, that sometimes could lead to domestic violence. Where are the new houses, and why are you backloading the DPU onto the future government rather than dealing with it yourself right now? Yeah, I have, I have, I have two things in response to that. First of all, um, you recall, of course, in 2014, when we actually committed to 2% in Wales, the next thing a Conservative government did was actually reduce defence spending below 1%. And since that time... I'll correct you on that, me, sir. Let, let, let I'll correct just, you on that. We made the commitment in 2014. It was a 10-year commitment. Guess what? That 10-year commitment ends now. You've been government nine years. Why aren't we hitting those targets? And... and when this, we get down is, to this it, is not you guys did creative accounting on Th Mr. Chair, this is my time. Well, hang on. This is not a um, question period. Um, so no, let, the, let the minister, I'm, I'm asking the minister to answer, try to answer your question, and then you can ask it again or defend. I'm just coming back. I was only creative the fact that when you committed to 2%, to, to 2 the very next thing a Conservative government did was reduce defence spending to its lowest amount in any Canadian history, less than 1%. And since that time, and this is rather important, Mr. Bazan, at the end of this year, we will have more than doubled defence spending, and every single nickel of that, I checked, you voted against it. Every single dollar so that we added to defence spending, we, you reduced. Well, let let's not forget that. I mean, we just had, question question now. Mr. Minister, we just had a motion in front of the House last week to, to put a freeze on the rent increases on our own military, and you voted against that, and we need to get that rolled back so we put more money in the hands of our, of our troops. But you went ahead anyway, and you still increased funding. You still went ahead and and we know that we have military members right now that are having to buy their own kit, uh, and we know that uh, that comes out of their own pocket. We were in Latvia last year as committee, and we actually saw it where troops were buying their own helmets, their own hearing protection, their own vests. You know, that uh, is, is despicable that they had to actually do that themselves. So I want to move on uh, to talk about, uh, but like we can play does, this game. Does the member not want to hear an answer to the housing question? 
Yeah. Well, so let's get no. to it in the, in okay, the so rhetoric. Go ahead, Minister. We're working very hard in bases right across the country with, with mayors and with the private sector. The Canadian Armed Forces has a great deal of property which is serviced and available for the building of, of, of military housing. We are working with the private sector and with, with other orders of government to utilize the value of that land to build housing for Canadian Armed Forces members. There are some extraordinary opportunities right across this country. Got we said right in our policy document that we are prioritizing Halifax, Toronto, and Vancouver, but I can tell you I have proposals. So I got a minute left, from, Minister. From Trenton, so from, let me just from say Petawawa, from, from Borden, and from Esquimo, there are many, still, many opportunities Minister, for us to respond respect, very quickly In these estimates, there's the still zero dollars, even if you're look, looking at working with municipalities, even if you're looking at working with uh, the private sector, there's zero dollars from the government going into military housing. Our bases need to be renovated. We know that in the last two years, only 38 homes were built for the Canadian Armed Forces. In my last minute here, I just wanted to ask what a question, you Minister. Guys built when you were here. You were um, just in March up in Edmonton, and you, you were asked a question about the CRV-7 rockets that uh, Ukraine asked for back in November. Uh, we, as, as a party and Pierre Paul, you asked the government to send them in February. And you and March said, we're doing the work right now to make sure these munitions can be safely transported, and it'll only be a matter of days and move quickly. Ukraine took that to say that they expected an announcement shortly. Why haven't the CRV-7 rockets been sent to Ukraine? They need them now. And where is the NASAM that you promised, or it was promised by Minister Anand 18 months ago? And, and we, we are working with the Ukrainians with respect to delivering the CRV-7s, but there is work ongoing, and perhaps that might be a question you want to ask the Deputy Minister, the status of, of the safety of, first of all, the utility and the safety of transporting uh, those munitions to Ukraine. And with respect, thank you for the question on, on the, the NASAMs. It, Ukraine said that they needed NASAM rockets. We don't have any. We went to the market to see if we could purchase them. It was going to take four or five years, so we went to the United States to expedite that, me, that acquisition. Excuse as me, as Minister, I've already reported to this committee many, many times, this is we getting gave way the United beyond States 20 seconds. 400 million dollars in order to 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 expedite that. They have placed the order. They they've promised us as soon as it comes off the production line, it will be delivered. But I'll also share with you, right. we, we've uh, heard very clearly the need as, for As important as this sharing might be, Mr. Bazan has finished his question. Six million dollars just two weeks ago, in order to minister. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Um, we're back to Mr. Fillmore. Hopefully, Mr. Fillmore, you appreciate that six minutes is actually six minutes. Thank you. I'm a stickler for any rule you set, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minister, thank you to you and the deputy uh, and the other witnesses for making time for us today. I'm very grateful for that. Um, Minister, as you know, I, I am very proud to represent Halifax, the home of uh, Canada's East Coast Navy. And the national shipbuilding strategy has been a tremendous economic driver uh, across the country, but in particular around Halifax and Nova Scotia, creating thousands of well-paying jobs, building the uh, next fleet of vessels for our Navy. Um, we're seeing the results of that now. In the last two weeks, we've commissioned HMCS William Hall, that was AOPS number four, into service. And over the weekend, I attended the naming ceremony for AOPS five, the future HMCS uh, Frederick Roulette. The, uh, we've got three more AOPS to go, two of them for the Coast Guard, and then we're going to turn our mind to building the 15 Canada Surface Combatants, or CSCs. Could you update the committee on the status of that work with the CSCs, please? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Fillmore. Um, please, first of all, in the estimates that I brought before you today, it includes uh, we are requesting $1.28 billion for the Canadian Surface Combatant Project. This funding is going to be used to support our work with industry to finalize the, 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 the selected ship design. It's also enhancing uh, shipyard infrastructure. And in fact, I have some very good news to share with this committee that starting in July of this, this year, uh, the, to ensure the shipyard in Halifax is prepared to get, begin full production in 2025, 20, that, that work will begin um, in, in, in starting to cut the steel for the surface combatant ships. 
Um, this, this work, as you have said, is, also, is, is very significant in that it creates, I think, long-term and sustainable job opportunities for workers in Halifax. It also is, is an, enables the Canadian Arm, Arm Navy to, to, to acquire the ships that they need to replace the Halifax frigates. And I would also take the opportunity, Andy, to point out that in the, uh, our new uh, Budget 2024 and in the, the, the new DPU, we've included a substantial amount of money, approximately $1.5 billion, to continue to maintain the Halifax frigates. And that will take place in shipyards right across the country, but certainly um, in Halifax. It's a very important place where this work gets done. So as the, the, the ship, uh, shipyard workers in Halifax continue with the construction of, of the new surface combatant fleet to replace the Halifax frigate, we are also now budgeting the money that is going to be required to keep the Halifax uh, in service, uh, to enable our, our, our Royal Canadian Navy to continue to deliver on the missions uh, to, to which we ask of them um, as we proceed with the important work of, of delivering a new and, and very exciting new platform for them. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Can you talk to the committee about how the CSCs will support Canadian sovereignty and security? Our intention is, is to, to deliver 15 new Canadian surface combatant missions. We have responsibilities, as, as you know, in, in NATO, particularly in the North Atlantic, but we have emerging and new responsibilities in the Indo-Pacific. And as, as the Admiral Topshi has, has shared with, with us and with, um, and, and with the Canadian public, fulfilling that mission with new capabilities. Um, one of the challenges that we have faced is, is, for example, we've been sending three of our Halifax frigates into the Indo-Pacific um, since, since we entered into th that strategy. And so right now, for example, I have uh, the, the Halifax is in the Indian Ocean, in, or excuse me, the Montreal is in the Indian Ocean and making its way um, in, in towards the Taiwan Strait. Um, those missions are, are critically important for us to demonstrate, first of all, Canada's commitment to the region, but also to, to alongside our allies, stand up for that international rules-based order. And one of the things we heard from the Indo-Pacific, for example, from those countries, is that they had an expectation that they would see a more persistent presence of Canada's military in the region. I've had a number of discussions with our Five Eyes partners, Australia and the United States in particular, about you know, the, the important work that they're doing and the capabilities that will be provided by the Canadian surface combatant ships is going to be an important contribution that Canada will make to do our part to maintain uh, adher adherence to that international rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific and I think demonstrate very ably to um, our allies. Additionally, we are, we are, are taking on additional responsibilities uh, with the advent of, of, of Finland and Nor uh, Finland and Sweden into, the, into NATO, I think there's a, there is going to be through NATO a, a much increased attention to our Arctic responsibilities in the northern frontier of NATO, and the surface combatant ships are going to play an incredibly significant and important role. And then finally, and, and as each of the things that Canada agrees to participate in in the Middle East, um, in, in, the, in the Red Sea, and, and in, in the Gulf of Aden, and in places right around the world, we want to make sure that our, the, the Navy has the capability to project our, our influence, but also to defend our crews in those areas, and the surface combatant ship is going to provide us with that capability. One minute, okay. Mr. Thank you, Mr. And Mr. Chair, time check, another minute? One minute. Uh, Minister, it's been two years since the Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we've seen the Ukrainian people demonstrate incredible resilience in defending their homeland. In that same time, Canada has stepped up with about $4 billion in military assistance to Ukraine. Um, could you give an update on the current scope of our assistance efforts and what impact they're having uh, on, on Ukraine? And, and if you have time, what does the future of our assistance look like? You don't have that much time. 30 seconds. Stay within time here. Um, our, we've, had, we've provided about $4 billion in, in military assistance, um, but at the same time, you know, there's much more work to be done. One of the challenges that we have faced in providing that assistance, as, as Mr. Mazan pointed out, is, is getting those deliveries done in a timely way. And so one of the things that we have done, we have provided all of the spare ammunition, for example, that we had, we've sent it to Ukraine. As a, as a consequence, Canadian stocks are, are, are somewhat diminished and we've got to replace those. But, but Canadian manufacturing and, and the production lines have somewhat of a limited capacity. We've now put money on the table through the DPU of, uh, to invest in those production lines and money for long-term contracts to increase production. But recognizing that it takes time to increase that production and to acquire th those munitions, We've also made deals. We're, we're going to have to leave that answer, the, that answer in order here. to acquire uh, artillery ammunition, and most recently with with the Germans, almost seventy six billion dollars committed to them, so that we can acquire air missile defense systems Minister, more quickly for for the. We Ukraine. have 
six minutes is, uh, has become six and a half minutes. Um, Madame Michaud, six minutes, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. And thank you to your colleagues for being with us this morning to answer your questions. It's very appreciated. First, I'd like to hear the minister on the situation on the non-public funds workers. They're not public servants. We're not fully fledged public servants, if you will. But did you work on behalf of the Chief of Defence Staff under the authority of the Minister of National Defence? As you probably know, they've been on strike since January 15. And their, their main requests are the following, which I'm sure you know as well. We're asking for a fair pay comparatively to the public service. And by abolishing a 1982 um, order in council pre uh, preventing from them being recognized as public servants, they want also uniform pay between the bases. They want stable pay as well. And compared to public servants, uh, they don't have the same benefits, the same protections that public servants have because of this order in council of 1982. So they don't fall under the um, labor laws that govern the public service. And they're also um, not paid as much. For example, an accountant at Valcartier is paid $10 less an hour than a person doing the exact same work on a base in Ottawa. So my question is the following. Does the minister consider that this is justifiable, that these workers in Quebec are sometimes paid 30% less than their counterparts in other provinces. And what is your department doing as we speak to solve this situation? Thank you very much, Christina. Um, first of all, as, as you mentioned, these, these employees are not public servants, um, but, but I feel a responsibility for them because the work they do on behalf of the Canadian Armed Forces and, and our members is really important and much valued by them. And so when this, this labor dispute first began, I, I reached out and, and I had a number of meetings with the public service uh, um, union um, and, and, and including a number of conversations with their president. I also spoke to the, the CEO of, of the, 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 the employer in, in this case and tried very hard to bring them together. Um, I reached out and worked with actually the president of the um, Canadian Labour Congress to, to try to get their assistance in appointing a, on a mediator because, you know, we really felt that, that we need, the best way to resolve this is at the bargaining table. That's, in, in my opinion, that's to bring the, keep the parties together and, and, and to keep them working on it. Um, I know that there was some progress made um, in that a number of the bargaining units outside of Quebec resolved their contracts. Um, I was, and I think as you were, we, we both shared a disappointment that they weren't able to reach an agreement uh, with those employees in Quebec, so we're going to continue to lean into it. Um, I think you know, th those are important people. They're not public servants, and I know there is some disparity between the, the public service pay levels, particularly after the, the most recent wage settlement for those employees, um, and, and these other employees which are not public servants, but their work is valued. And, and so I think there's still a lot of work to do in, 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 among those in Quebec, and we'll continue to work. With, the, the, with their union representatives, with anyone that would help bring the parties together um, to provide whatever assistance they can. And, and I apologize, I'm not going to weigh in on what the outcome of those negotiations are. Frankly, I'm not a party to those negotiations, as you've acknowledged. But I think it's important that we continue to do everything we can to keep them at the bargaining table to come to an appropriate and fair resolution for those workers. Thank you, Minister. Of course, you're not at the negotiating table, I agree. But I'm sure that the department has some sway, some power. For example, you could uh, modify this order in council or abrogate it. As you said, it, they're not public servants uh, compared to our public service here. But by abolishing this order in council from 1982, you would solve the issue. Is that a possible solution? Would your government go ahead with abolishing this 1982 order in council so that they can become fully-fledged public servants. I'm sure that would solve m most of the issues. 1982, this relationship has worked fairly well for those employees. There is a labor dispute clearly going on right now. I think my, my best response, fulfillment of my responsibilities is to do everything I can to facilitate um, the, the a mutually acceptable uh, negotiated settlement between the parties. I, I will share with you, I'm not at the present time contemplating changing the legislation. Thank you for your honesty. I'd like to come back to military spending. 
that proverbial NATO 2%. There was a letter published last week. It was signed by 23 Republican and Democrat senators of the United States asking uh, Canada to respect its 2014 commitments to NATO. That is to say that to spend 20% on of their defense spending on equipment to modernize its capacity, so on and so forth. The fact that U.S. senators came out with a public letter putting pressure on Canada, uh, is it working? That's my first question. Do you feel, does your department feel more pressure to increase spending? And number two, does this have an impact uh, on your relationship with our allies? When other countries see that we're not attaining our objectives under our NATO commitments, can this have a negative impact on our relationship with allies? Thank, thank you very much. First of all, the pressure I feel is to deliver for the Canadian Armed Forces the equipment that they need and the support for their people and, and the people that they need to do the, the jobs the Canadians ask of them. Um, I think that's my first responsibility, and so that's the pressure I feel. Um, and at the same time, um, I think as well, we have a responsibility in, in, in government, all, and that includes all of us, by the way, to make sure that when we spend Canadian taxpayer dollars, we, we actually create a real return on that investment of public value. And, and so making sure that we spend the money well. I have good news and that we will reach that 20% standard this year and every year thereafter under the current spending initiative of, of spending on new equipment. But I think it's really important, first of all, for the Canadian Armed Forces to well define what their requirements are and for then us to have robust procurement processes to get the best Thank value you. for Canadians. Thank you, Minister. Always good to leave a question on good news. Mm. Madame Matheson, six minutes. Um, Minister, have you seen the videos of people in Rafa screaming as they have burn, been burned alive in their tents yesterday? No, um, you have not seen them? No. no? Um, <clears throat> so you did not see the images from the, the bombing that, that took place for the displaced persons in the camp uh, where people were told that they would be safe? Uh, I asked you weeks ago about the upcoming uh, testing event hosted by your department in Alberta, in which Israeli weapons tested on Palestinians will be showcased. Have you cancelled this event? No, and to be clear, that's not what we were testing. What, was, what we, were te we were testing, and there were a number of participants, including Israel, we were testing defensive systems to defeat drone attacks, so that when, if drones were sent to gain our armed forces, we were looking for the best technology to defeat those drones. There was nothing offensive about what was being tested in Alberta. However, that company that was allowed to participate uh, was the uh, Israeli weapons were allowed into Canada that hosting the event, these weapons were, are being marketed as battle tested on Palestinians. The owners of that company boasted about testing them on Palestinians. They boasted about this war being good for, for their company and they're, they're being tested on these innocent civilians. Um, children have been slaughtered, Minister. Uh, your government is supporting that. Can you explain how Canada can, can continue to support this when the Israeli government is committing genocide? Directly, Palestinian civilians are being placed into safe zones, and then they're being uh, hit with 2,000-pound bombs on those safe zones. I have to correct something you said because our government is not supporting that. As a matter of fact, we have made, you, you know... allow them into Alberta, sir. Well, well again, I, I, with great respect, you misrepresent. And I'm no. sure you do it inadvertently, but you misrepresent what we were actually doing in Alberta. We were testing defensive capabilities and looking for the best technologies for the Canadian Armed Forces in order to defend our country and our troops. Now, but you also said that we defend... Uh, or we support, you know, the, 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 the death of innocence. And that's absolutely un untrue. Um, Canada has taken a very strong position with respect to calling for an immediate ceasefire, calling for um, protection of innocent lives, to, to, for in, improving access of humanitarian aid into the region. And, and so I think your characterization of, of my country or our country's support for, for those activities is, is, is not correct. And, and in fact, I think we have condemned those 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 actions and called for um, them to cease. You may condemn them in, in public, but certainly what's being allowed in terms of, of happening in this country, there was prizes awarded in this competition, Minister. 
Um, last time you came to this committee, I asked about the arms trade, uh, arms trade treaty commitments amidst this war. When I asked you if Canada's interoperability with allies is more important than our commitment to human rights and international law, you said, of course not. However, you've taken no steps to stop Canada's participation in the Lockheed Martin F-35 fighter jet program. You are making Canadians complicit in this genocide, and your defense policy update spoke about making it easier to procure within the American military industrial complex. The uh, International Court of Justice has ordered Israel to immediately, immediately halt its siege on Rafah. Will you commit to applying our arms trade treaty responsibilities today to ensure that our tax dollars are not supporting the siege? Uh, well, if I may, I think con conflating the tragedy that's unfolding in Gaza um, with our acquisition of a new fighter jet for the Canadian Armed Forces is, is uh, quite frankly, unclear to me as, as to how those two uh, are actually coexisting um, or, or, or are in any way um, mutually supportive. I, I think there is the, making sure that the Canadian Armed Forces get the best capability to do the important job we ask of them of defending Canada, defending Canada's interest in fulfilling our obligations um, to, to our, our international coalition partners in, in NORAD and NATO and in other parts of the world um, is, is, is our responsibility to make sure our people have the best equipment. There was a very robust uh, procurement yes, process. They are to our responsibility. The However, there are, there are more options than just one, and certainly being complicit and not abiding by our own trade treaty obligations is also a decision that is clearly made. It is a choice, Minister. Well, we, we've obviously made the choice to acquire the F-35 after a very rigorous and, and long uh, procurement process. Um, and as I shared with this committee earlier, that we we're actually working hard and, and have money here to facilitate the delivery of the first 16 of those. One minute, please. The, the Liberal Caucus, of which you are a part, voted in favour of our motion in March calling on, a ce on the ceasing of further authorization and transfer of arms exports in Israel. We know that the majority of Canadian exports to Israel's military are in space and satellite technology. So I was shocked earlier this month when I asked within this committee, Space Canada and MDA Space, what communications they've received from your department and government on this. They have not seen any promised notes to exporters, nor have they received any communications from your department on their prospective sales in Israel. Will your government issue this notice? Yeah. First of all, the people that you were speaking to are not the people that are involved in those sales. It requires, under a very rigorous um, Canadian um, e military export permit regime that is operated by GAC, um, it is the Global Affairs that, that administers that regime, and I'm advised by GAC that they have not issued a permit since the, the a, a permit for um, export of, of any military equipment or technology to Israel since the October 7th. And the fact that they have absolutely no Thank indication. You. Of Thank you, Ms. Madison. We're now on to a five-minute round. <clears throat> Mr. Kelly, five minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, on December 7th, you uh, told this committee that Canada had quadrupled its artillery shell order and that those shells would be delivered the following year, 2024. On April 15th, I asked you when this commitment to quadruple the ammunition order would be fulfilled. You didn't answer the question. Uh, so I'll ask again, on what date will Canada take delivery of the additional production of 155 millimeter shells, particularly the M795 variant. Yeah, I, I, I recently went to the factory to, to talk to them about um, the, the, the delivery of existing orders, but we also talked, I think, very importantly, um, those, those factories in Canada, and I've met with them all now, and they, one of the things they told us is that they needed to increase their production lines. They needed to secure... You had a chance to answer this question in April and you didn't. Or can you answer it now today? On what date? If you don't know, just say you don't know and we'll, well move on. Well, I, I, with great respect, and it doesn't matter how simply you ask the question, it doesn't make it a simple question. But you gave me a simple answer. You said it was going to be this year, so we're already in May. Well, but again, it, it, the delivery of munitions from those factories is limited by their production capabilities. We have come through in the DPU and in this budget, which I'm hoping you'll get an opportunity to vote for. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that. I take that you don't have a date. You don't have a date, so we'll move on. And we now have money in the in the budget. Okay, thank you, Minister. To offer on what date will Canada to acquire those munitions? On what date will Canada acquire 
ground-based air defenses to defend critical infrastructure, including our own troops in Latvia. And, and, and first of all, the, a contract was signed for the troops in Latvia for ground-based air defense systems. That contract was signed about five months ago. Um, okay. And they will be delivered when we ramp up to brigade, I'm told, the, the delivery schedule, and perhaps as a question um, that our officials might be able to answer and give you a more precise date, but I'm, I'm assured that those that capability will be delivered when we go to Brigade Strength in 2026. Okay, so, so your predecessor misled Canadians and said 14 months ago that an air defense system was en route to Ukraine, and now you've, in, earlier in your testimony today, uh, admitted that it is uh, a part of a back order of uh, a production order. I missed, I missed your question. I thought you were talking the air defense systems that, the, the ground I, air, I am. air I, defense I, systems for yes. Latvia, and then you brought right. up the Right, because, the, because the, Minister, the issue. you have a credibility problem, your government has a credibility problem when you announce uh, delivery or announce that, that something has been acquired. You had already announced in the case of the defense system that we were procuring for Ukraine uh, 14 months ago, you said it was on, your predecessor said it was en route, but your testimony today is, and, and we know that it is not even uh, produced yet. So can, can you give us a date on which Canada is going to acquire the vital ground defense uh, system for our troops and, in Latvia and other critical infrastructure? Well, and, and with respect to Latvia, the contracts are signed and, and th those missions are now in production. We have been provided with a delivery date, which coincides with us ramping up to brigade strength in 2026. There are other munitions, by the way, and other contracts that we've signed for anti-tank missiles and, and anti-drone systems, but the, the air, the ground-to-air uh, missile defense, the contract is signed, okay. and the delivery schedule for those munitions is scheduled for 2026. Okay, thank you. Uh, your, your DPU talks about exploring options for modernizing our, our artillery. Um, Assuming that the NDP allows these estimates to pass, on what date will Canada receive expanded artillery platforms? I think I can assume that, that you and, and members of your party will not vote for any defence spending because that, your record speaks for itself. Deeds speak... Support this government. We will vote non-confidence in this government at every and, opportunity. And, and therefore, um, we, we are, we've introduced a budget that actually provides industry with exactly what they said they required from us. Investment in production and the money that provided the certainty of long term contracts, once this budget passed, we have already begun the process and we will enter into those negotiations with our Canadian industries that will create Canadian jobs, it will increase Canadian production and it will deliver for the Canadian Armed Forces the munitions that they need. So your DPU says you, you will support explore... support it or not? Your, your D, uh, the, uh, I support getting the troops the, the kit that they need, Minister, and, and I'd like to know if, you, if these estimates contain any certainty around or a, or a date or, or funding authorization for the replacement and modernization of our artillery. 30 seconds or less, please. Yeah, there's, money, there's money here and, and in the, the upcoming budget that we've presented. Um, the dates will be determined as quickly as we can pass that. And so, again, although I know you're not going to vote for it, um, if you could just get out of the way and let us bring that forward, then we'll get it passed. All right. So, are, are a critical part of maritime defense. Uh, are there, is there anything in these estimates to replace our 40-year-old submarines? No, because and, and perhaps I, I was unclear. But when we said we we had some work to do with respect to submarines, we need submarines. We've got to replace the Victoria class fleet. They're old. They're they're unserviceable. They can't do the job. So we've got we've got work to do Thank to replace you, them. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And that work is underway. Thank you, Minister. Madame Lalonde, five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about two things. So, uh, good morning, <coughs> Minister. It's a pleasure to, to have you with us. Um, the external monitor, Madame Terrien, recently released a report uh, which illustrated some of the progress that DND CAF have made towards cultural evolution. Uh, but she does note uh, numerous times that there's uh, still much more work to be done, particularly in streamlining of the grievance process. And I have to say, Minister, we did hear here in this committee uh, some of the barrier and some of the <laughs> uh, aggravated uh, component of this grievance process. I would like to know a little bit about what's your interpretation of this report from the external monitor, and is DNDCAF effectively equipped to deal with the shortcomings that she is actually raising? Thank you. I'm very grateful for the, the report of the external monitor. And she and I have had, in addition to her report, we've had a number of conversations about her concerns on the grievance process. In January of 18th of this year, um, I, I approved um, uh, authorizing General Carignan 
to resolve all grievances, to have the authority to resolve grievances for amounts less than $25,000. Um, that was actually the vast majority of these grievances. Um, really great news. In a two-month period, General Carignan reports that more than 70% of those grievances have now been resolved. And I think it's really important that we be as efficient and quick as possible. People have been waiting a very long time for resolution of these matters. Um, and, and I think that's because that takes a, a vast majority, a large number of, of these grievances and deals with them in a more appropriate and timely way. It will also enable us to dedicate the resources for the more complex ones. But, but again, I think I, um, the Madam Therion's report was very useful advice in, in helping us focus on the things that were important that, that for the members, and she was hearing very clearly is what we've been hearing from the members, a level of frustration on, on getting these matters resolved. I would also point out, as, as Madam Justice Therion did, there are a number of things in our legislation, Bill C-66, with respect to the independence of, of judicial actors, a number of things that are form, often form part of these grievances. And so, again, I would come back to this committee and, and ask, I, when we when we can bring that, that, that bill to this committee, there's really important work to be done here on it, but I think that there are things in that, that legislation um, which I think we can all agree would be very helpful to the men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces. I'll agree with you, and certainly I know how important uh, bringing this bill, so I want to say thank you for this. And I know that you mean um, right in saying that you're looking forward to see this bill coming to this committee in advancing and making it even maybe stronger. So I appreciate this. I want to take you back a little bit of this conversation that we had about the the, you know, our 2% and, and the DPU. But I also, we, we tend to forget, and maybe some of our partners and our ally forget, the strong commitment on NORAD. Um, so as you mentioned, this particular estimate in this budget that we know, unfortunately, uh, some member in the House of Commons will vote against, which is a direct impact in providing that operational um, readiness that you have mentioned. Maybe share some thoughts about where and why it is so important that we pass this budget as early as possible. One of the things that I, I, I noted that the 23 senators who's, who's, who wrote a letter to the Prime Minister uh, last week, one of the things they did not acknowledge in the letter, but I think it's an important thing. I was down in Washington two weeks ago. I met with the Secretary of Defense. I met with a number of other uh, legislators there as well. And when we talked about Canada's new investment in defense, I think they were very encouraged by it. But in particular, and, and I, would, I, I, don't, I don't like to quote him, he speaks well for himself, but the commander of NORAD, and has talked a lot very publicly about the nearly $40 billion Canada is, is investing in NORAD modernization, the acquisition of new capabilities, new capital equipment as, as part of that, and frankly with, with the introduction of our new defence policy, again, the, the, he, he was very um, supportive and even complimentary to, to the work that we were, are doing. Um, I think there's, it's important as well, we acknowledge in our own defence policy update we're doing a great deal. We have more to do. We're going to do more. But in order, when you're spending taxpayer dollars, you've got to do it right. You've got to do it well. And that means giving the Canadian Armed Forces the opportunity and the time to define their requirements and then to work through our rigorous but necessary um, procur procurement processes to get the best value for Canadian tax dollars. And so, like I said, we're, we're increasing our defence spending by 27% next year over, over this it's going to be really challenging for us to spend that money well, but we're absolutely committed to doing it. 15 seconds, please. Well, I'll just say thank you very much, uh, Minister, and certainly if I don't have a chance, I will also would like to uh, thank uh, Deputy Minister Matthews for uh, him being so available to us in this committee. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Ms. Lalonde. Madame um, uh, Michaud, uh, 2.5 minutes, s'il vous plaît. You have 2.5 minutes. Thank you. Mr. Minister, you spoke about uh, investments that will be made very shortly, but in September 2023, your government announced um, important cuts. Back then, you said it, would ha it wouldn't have impacts on our operational capacities, but the Chief of Defence Staff said it was impossible to reduce defence budget by $1 billion without it having any consequences Nevertheless, you announced new investments in your, in your new policies, so it seems contradictory what we hear, and the Chief of Defence Staff has said himself that for him it's, it's difficult to, um, to understand all these contradictory statements. Maybe uh, this confusion stems from a lack of vision? 
coming from the department? Can you re reassure the forces and tell us clearly what's going on? Will there be cuts over the next two years or will there be uh, more investment over the next few years for the future? What's going on? I, I stand by my statement. We're increasing defense spending next year over this year by 27 percent. And that includes the Treasury Board's refocusing of spending. But one of the things when you're spending Canadian taxpayer dollars that I think is absolutely incumbent upon us, it's our responsibility, to make sure that we're spending their dollars well and to look and make sure that we're producing real value for every dollar we invest. And so it, it is entirely appropriate for the entire public service and every bureaucracy to look at how they're spending money, particularly on things like executive travel or consultant services or even some professional services. And I say some because some of them are absolutely essential to, to our, our members and our capabilities. But we are, in, in the net, increasing our defense spending by 27%. And, and by the way, those refocusing of, of spending, it's not supposed to be easy. It's hard. That's why we do it, because it's hard and it's necessary. And so it has been, you know, it's certainly been challenges to, to ask, you know, the, the, the military and the Department of National Defense have been doing things a certain way for a long time. And just to go back and check and making sure that we're producing real value for every dollar we invest in defense is, is it's the job. And so we're doing that job. And at the same time, we're very, very significantly in, uh, increasing the amount of money that they'll be made available to them to get the job done. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Masson, two and a half minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, last time you appeared uh, here, we talked briefly about the investment in, in Arctic infrastructure for dual-use programs and projects. Uh, we heard directly from General Wayne Eyre, who called his time being stuck in Cambridge Bay as another war story. Uh, today, I, uh, I've just brought and signed a letter uh, with my colleague NDP MP for Nunavut, uh, Lori Idlut. Cambridge Bay needs their runway paved and expanded to tackle their serious food crisis and to have robust access to health care. Uh, I would like to give you that letter today, but I would like you to commit and ask you that you commit to reading it and uh, consider designating Cambridge Bay as a northern operational support hub. First of all, I'll absolutely commit to reading it. I was in Nunavut three weeks ago. I met with all the northern premiers. I, I, I was in Iqaluit. Um, we had conversations about multi-use infrastructure investments in the north. There are a number of, I think, I think the, the needs of the, of the north are very obvious and clear to us all, and, 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 and I think um, I, I think I see, take your advocate. Well, and with respect to Cambridge Bay, first of all, the money that I, in, in defense, there are other investments that also need to be made in infrastructure. Some of that's transportation, some of that's you know the Northern Affairs. But the investments that we need to make from the defense standpoint is first of all, I've got to work with the, the with the Northern Territories, but also with Indigenous leadership in the North, to determine the best place for us to to put our assets in order to do the job of defending the North. At the same time, I think there's an extraordinary opportunity, which you highlight, to actually increase our investment in infrastructure that will be mutually beneficial to the people that live in those communities. Because an air, an air pipe runway, for example, can also be used to bring in other transport of goods or medical evacuations. There's a whole bunch of mutually, benefited, mutually beneficial things that we can do that will be aligned. I'll happily read the letter. And I will also undertake, we're going to continue to work with the territorial governments, with northern communities, with northern representatives, and in particular with indigenous communities, because it's their land. We benefit by, by consultation with them. We'll work really closely with them. And, and, and I invite you to continue to, to advocate around that and, and, and your colleague as well. Ms. Madsen? I actually have 15 seconds. I know you have 15 seconds. And you've given other time to, to other members well, to expand. Well, um, I am trying to get back on track, otherwise we won't get through expense, this round. Sir. At my expense. Do your 15 seconds. Thank you. Uh, Canada had the worst wildfire fire season year on record last year. Uh, experts have predicted that this year is worse. It's, it actually is never stopped. Uh, the DPU didn't acknowledge um, Operation in Operation Lentis um, and the importance on that, uh, considering we're facing those climate catastrophes fueled by an action on climate change. Why do you think that the status quo was enough? Unfortunately, Ms. Matson's uh, 15 seconds expired a while back. Um, we'll move on to Mr. Allison. Five minutes, please. We'll about that later. Mr. Allison. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, I didn't. Mr. Minister, thank you very much for being here. Um, I, get, I, got a, I got a question for you. Um, you know, L Lieutenant General Andrew Leslie has talked about how unprepared we are, uh, and as a former um, Chief of Staff, um, 
for our NATO, for, for our allies, and for the work he's done, as, even as elected member into your party. I would like to say his uh, one comment here, I'd like you to get your response to that. This current Prime Minister of Canada is not serious about defence, full stop. Well, we, I, first of all, I have a great deal of respect for Andy, and he's a friend of mine. Um, we, we've been friends and colleagues for a long time. Um, and and I, I have respect for his opinion, but with, uh, respectfully, I would disagree with him on that. Um, the Prime Minister has been, I think, demonstrated a remarkable seriousness on defence. And during his time as Prime Minister, we have more than doubled defence spending, and we've, we've just approved um, a, a, a defence policy that will in fact, triple our defence spending over, over, over the term of its, of its five years. But, but, but even beyond that, the Prime Minister has also made it clear that we still need to, to do more, okay, and we're thanks. going to do more with respect to integrated air missile defence, submarines, et cetera. Thank you, so I would, I would just point that out to my, my very good friend and, and respected colleague, Andy Leslie. Uh, you know, deeds all, speak, and, and his, the Prime Minister's deeds, I think, speak well. I think, I think you know, from his experience, uh, his Lieutenant Colonel, actually, or, sorry, Lieutenant General, actually matters a lot in terms of what he's able to bring to the table. He also said that uh, a large number of his Cabinet Ministers are not serious about defence either. So uh, I'll leave those statements for now. But, uh, you know, one of the things he's challenged with is the whole issue of preparedness. And uh, a, a lot of my colleagues have talked about this. He talks about the Arctic, and we've had, we've had people in here to talk about the Arctic, and he said just in terms of numbers, there's 22 professional men and women in the U.S. Armed Forces based in the Arctic, mainly in Alaska, and there's about 30 to 35,000 Russian Armed Forces based in the Arctic, but Canada only has 300 people. So we talk about preparation. What's your response to our Arctic, which is obviously a, a very important area for us in terms of... Really good news, Dean. I, I go read our, our new defense policy update, Our North Strong and Free. That's our response, our response to the Arctic, and it talks about the, the necess necessity of, of investing and persistently deploying Canadian Armed Forces members there. We've talked a lot about in NORAD modernization, but now also in the DPU, about the really important focus that we have to have in defending the continent and defending our country, particularly from emerging threats. Um, in the first part of that document, like I said, I'd, I would invite you to take a look at it. Um, I don't disagree, by the way. Um, the fact that our ships are nearly 40 years old, some of the planes our Air Force has been flying in are 40 years old. Um, th those things really, I think, demonstrate generations of ill preparedness. But okay. our response to that is to we're investing in new fighter planes, we're investing in new supply ships, we're investing in new combat support ships. So we're I, going I, to be investing in new submarines, and we're we putting one. new capabilities in the north. Thank you. I, I just got a couple minutes left here. So in talking about preparation uh, for operational readiness, we have uh, we've seen CBC actually reported that there's been changes to the training force by budget cuts that could lead leave the military less ready for a fight. Uh, and all this while a mere 61 percent of the force are ready for operations. So I guess my question is, with budget cuts, uh, looking at uh, operational readiness, uh, how do we explain, you know, we're sending people for training uh, over in Lafayette and a number of places where we don't have enough trainers to train people to fly here in Canada. I, I would love to talk about the operational preparedness that we have of troops on the ground, plus also what we're dealing with here back home in our own fighters. Good news, Dean, because in, in, in Latvia we're working in a coalition environment. There's 10 different countries that are working with Canada. Canada's leading in Latvia. There's a new training base being developed there, and, and our, our soldiers, a decision was made by the Canadian Armed Forces that the best place for them to complete their training was in that coalition environment, using the equipment and working side by side with our coalition partners there. And, and frankly, that was an operational decision uh, which, which I agree with because it just seems like a, a smart way to get the job done. The challenge that we are facing is not that we don't have great trainers or even great, great training capability in this country. It's our staffing problem, and that, I think, is job one. And, and I, if, if you're suggesting that we need to do a much better job of onboarding people into the Canadian Armed Forces, last year, 70,000 people applied to join the Canadian Armed Forces, and, and just a little over 4,000 of them actually got in. That's not good enough. We have to do better, and we're going to do better. And finally, how much... 20 seconds. I guess finally, in terms of the Arctic, when, when, do you, when do you see us having more troops ready to be there? Well, the work has already begun. We're, we're, we are, we're in the north already, and you know, I'm, I've also met with the Ranger program with almost 2,600 people right across the north. Now, they're not military, but they're really important eyes and ears, and they perform a really important function in, in the military, and we're going to continue to support them as well. We just last, a, a couple of weeks ago, um, 
broke ground on a new, on new facility for JTFN in, in, in Yellowknife. We're already beginning to make those investments. And, and okay. in, in fairness, the, the policy document the just came out. There. The, the Canadian Armed Forces is clearly turning Minister. their strong attention and their capabilities yeah. to making sure that we're ready in the north. Minister. <laughs> Sorry. I don't, I don't know who's the worst one at this table. Like, gee, it, it's a neck and neck among the whole lot of you. Um, final question, Madame Lapointe. It's five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Hello, Minister. I note that uh, the, the, a significant portion of the main estimates is set aside for major capital projects, and that it would include the Canadian multi-mission aircraft procurement project, as well as the future fighter capability project. Can you speak to this committee about the significance of these major investments? And just as importantly, how are we ensuring that we are procuring the right capabilities for our forces at the best price? and, and value for Canadians. Yeah, thanks very much, Viv. And, and I'll just highlight some of the, the really important and challenging work that was done on the multi-mission aircraft uh, project that was was done. The, the, first of all, the Air Force clearly defined their requirements to, repl to replace the C-140s, um, which have been a great plane, with cr crewed by extraordinary people, but in service for a little over 40 years. And it was time to replace them. And, and because of the important work, they're, they're primarily submarine hunters. And, and so the, the Armed Forces cl very cl clearly defined their requirements, and then our team at D&D &D went out and looked in the marketplace to see what was available. And there was only one plane that was available that could be delivered in a timely way within the two-year frame that the Air Force had defined as their requirement. And, and so we went through a, a process, and, and frankly, in an ideal situation, I think we would have had spent a lot more time uh, working with Canadian aeronautic industry in particular. But in this case, time is a bit of a commodity, and, and it wasn't really available to us. And so a decision was made, I think the right decision, in, in my opinion, the only decision, to acquire uh, the, the Poseidon P-8 as the multi-mission aircraft for the, uh, the, the Royal Canadian Air Force. We, as well, have been working with them and, and making sure that we have the, the supply planes that are available so that we can, we can fuel our, 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 our aircraft in, in, um, on long-range on long missions. We're also investing in, in an RPAS system of, of unmanned drones for the high Arctic as well. And so, the, first of all, the, the, what is required? It, it's not a matter of some political person going through a shopping list. It's about the Canadian Armed Forces telling us what they need. They do that in consultation with all of our allies. They look at their needs and requirements and the job that they have to do, and they tell us what they need. And then we've got great people who go into the marketplace and work through the, the important procurement processes to make sure that, first of all, we get the Armed Forces what they need, but just as importantly, we get real value for Canadian taxpayer dollars. So when you're spending other people's money, you should do it carefully. And we have to be able to demonstrate to them that we have gone out and got the best deal possible and acquired the best capability for the, the Armed Forces. That's, that's the job. It takes time. Um, and, and it can be frustrating because you've also got to ramp up production. And sometimes the delivery of these things, you know, it, the, the announcement that we've signed a contract is, is, is important, but the delivery of these things is every bit as important. And that's why there's also a huge amount of work that needs to get done in order to make sure that the delivery stays on schedule and stays on budget and that, that the armed forces get what they need. Thank you, Minister. C can you share with this committee about uh, the new emerging threats in the cyber domain? And, and are there any targeted or specific measures around this, the cyber threat in the main estimates to address these? Yeah, there is actually a pretty significant investment in the main estimates, but also in the DPU. Um, in, in, in the communication security establishment itself, and, and I'm joined here by the chief today, Chief Xavier. Um, I, would, I would point out, first of all, the threat environment is evolving and becoming far more concerning with each passing day. We are seeing the activities of certain adversaries, um, notably China, but also Russia and other uh, adversaries as well, um, that are constantly attacking critical infrastructure in our systems. 
I think the CSE does a pretty re remarkable job of protecting our systems, but what we've seen is those same adversaries are now targeting some of our northern regional governments and, and, and some of our uh, provincial uh, and, and municipal governments as well, and other forms of critical infrastructure. And so we are, are investing fairly significantly um, through this, these main estimates, but also in the DPU to increase, I think, what is already an extraordinary capability. You know, and, and Viv, I'd be remiss if I didn't share with this committee I've had a number of conversations with our allies, particularly in Five Eyes, but also in NATO. Canada's cyber capability is considered first in class, right around the world. Um, it's something that I think, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of brag about this because most people, I think, we don't, we don't want to scare people, but at the same time, um, our people are doing remarkable work. Uh, their, their work is valued by all of our allies. It's one of the reasons we're making even more significant because they're demonstrating real value for every dollar we spent at, C spend at CSE. And we believe that by spending more dollars, as is, as is reflected in these estimates and in our new DPU, is going to produce real value for Canadians. Thank you, uh, Ms. Blatt. With that, we will have to uh, bring our first hour to a close. Thank you, uh, Minister, for your uh, contribution to this animated conversation. Um, a little, and um, oh, yes, and uh, we we appreciate it. we appreciate your appearance here uh, from time to time, sometimes more than other times. So uh, with that, we will suspend. Uh,